Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, we want that faith of our fathers to be in our hearts, that we might be those firmly grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the word of God may be the thing that gives light to our path and guides our ways, and that we might indeed be those who are generous and other-preferring, self-sacrificing for the life of the world. Lord, you have called us out to be your people, to be your family, to be the hands and feet of you in the world. Would you let us, Lord, live such a witness and testimony to the good news of you, who was rich and became poor for our sakes, so that we who are poor might be made rich. Father, would you be glorified by every word of my mouth? May every meditation of every heart in this room be acceptable in your sight. Today, Lord, let us rely on you in all things as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, it is uh, amazingly good to be home. Mimi and I missed you all more than you could possibly know, but it was very good for us to be away. We've come back charged up, inspired, and energized for the good work of the gospel here at Christ Church. Most of you know that my wife Mimi and I uh, have been away in Jerusalem. We were honored and um, delighted to be delegates to the 2018 Global Anglican Future Conference, also known as GAFCON. It was a gathering of 2,000 faithful Anglican leaders from all over the world gathered together there in Jerusalem where the faith began in order to fight for orthodoxy within the Anglican communion. So many of you have come up to me and said that you followed along online or you woke up in the morning and caught up with what had happened in the day since we were about eight hours ahead of you. You were able to hear the stirring talks, the biblically faithful teachings, the beautiful music and worship, and just had this reminder that the Anglican communion, the third largest church in the world, is made up of people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. You heard voices from Uganda and England and Nigeria and America and beyond, all declaring together an unwavering commitment to submitting our lives to the Word of God in everything that we do. Now, if this is the first you've heard of this, Maybe you were gone for two weeks and didn't know that I was gone for two weeks. I encourage you all to go to the GAFCON website and listen to some of the talks, catch some of the videos, but I implore you to go read the final statement that came out of that conference for a couple of reasons. On the one hand, it'll give you a sense of the good and godly worship and teaching that went out from Jerusalem this past week. But it will also remind you of the significant challenges facing the Anglican communion across the world. But I want you to be of good courage in it all because the bold theme of GAFCON 2018 was we will proclaim the gospel faithfully to the nations. And while Mimi and I were thrilled to be there, we're also glad to be back with you to get on with that good work to proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations right here at Christ Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Well, this morning's sermon doesn't really allow me to tell you all of the things that happened at GAFCOM, but I do want to share with you two things that really struck me while I was there. The first is that I was reminded yet again of the pitched battle for Orthodox Christian faith in which we are engaged. And secondly, I thanked God that GAFCON gave me hope because I was reminded again that we do not do this battle alone, but rather we are made one worldwide family of faith. So first, let me tell you something and mention something about the nature of the battle that's going on, not just within Anglicanism, but across all of our Christian denominations. You know, in some ways, the Catholics and the Orthodox, who are the two largest Christian bodies in the world, haven't had this fight yet in a public setting. 
We are waging it as the third largest body in the world, and we know that denominations across the globe are watching to see how it is that we fight over the truth of the gospel. So we do this, and we want to do it faithfully and graciously and boldly so that we might set an example to the rest of the Christian world. Our faith in Christ is in direct conflict with this secular age. And while we know that the battle has already been won by the Lord, it is still our task in our day to fight the battle in front of us, to proclaim the gospel over against the false teachings of this fallen and broken world. All across North America and Europe, what we call the West of this world, our culture believes a whole series of lies that the good life can somehow be had apart from the Holy Spirit, that power and sex and financial security and leisure are somehow going to make life worth living, that pleasure is the highest good to which we can obtain, and that sacrificing and suffering is something that we must resist with all of our being. In the face of that message, that secular spirit of the West, We proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ faithfully. Our task is to tell the world the truth as an antidote to its lies. We tell them the truth, that the good life comes only from being in communion with the God of all creation, that status and sensuality and stuff and entertainment and good grades and winning sports teams None of those things will fill us. But the good life comes from laying down your life for the sake of others, regardless of whether they're a friend or an enemy, an American or an immigrant, black or white. That picking up our cross and telling the world the good news of God's love, that is our highest purpose. That is our greatest goal. And that suffering with Christ is not something that we are called to resist, but rather something that we have been privileged and blessed to participate in as God gives himself for the life of the world. My friends, if we are going to proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations, then we must let his spirit shake us out of our own secular slumber so that we might embrace the call of the gospel on our own lives and live it out faithfully in the world. And of course, the secular spirit of this age has taken root not just in the culture, but in the churches in that culture. We know that a growing list of denominations have moved away from faithful dependence on the Word of God as our only guide for life. They prefer to present a watered-down version of the faith so that the world is not offended by the gospel. One of the leaders this week said, when the gospel is not offensive, it is no longer the gospel. I paraphrase greatly, but that was the spirit of what he said, and I thought, that is the truth. Now, the presenting issue for us in the West has been sex, but we know that that has always been just the tip of the iceberg. The problem is much more deeply rooted than that. The world does not want to listen to what Scripture says about just about anything, quite frankly. And so when we resist that, that becomes the headlines. But what we know is that our world resists what Scripture says about why we are male and why we are female. Our culture wants to do whatever they want to do with all that is at their disposal and certainly with their bodies. So rather than speak out with a call to disciplined, holy living, Branches of the church have chosen to celebrate instead of rebuke the rampant sensuality of our culture. What God calls sin in his word, they want to call a blessing. And we have a duty out of love to call them back lovingly and patiently back from that heresy. 
Many of those same churches are reluctant to proclaim what Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, that he is the only way, he is the only truth, he is the only life, that there is no means to return to the Father except through him. Now, the secular world around us doesn't want to believe that there's only one way to heaven, because if there is only one God, then he needs to be obeyed through discipline and obedience, and that would cramp our style. How can a church so give up on the word of God that they would agree that all world religions are equally valid, that they all lead up the same mountain? Did Christ go to the cross for nothing? Again, we are the church remaining faithful to the word of God, and we will proclaim Christ faithfully in our place, lovingly and patiently calling many even in the church back from heresy. And lest we point our finger too sternly at those churches and not listen to the Word of God as it calls even more conservative churches back to the voice of Scripture whenever it conflicts with the things that they want to believe, we hear God's Word call us today in Deuteronomy to think about the world around us in a way that's different than we're told to on TV. Today's lesson from Deuteronomy convicts us of how the world around us encourages us to clutch on to what is our own and to ignore what God says about how we are to treat the poor and the alien and the outcast and the oppressed. In Deuteronomy today, God rebukes hard-hearted and tight-fisted spirits And he declares that they will never cease to be among you poor in your land. And so he commands us to open up our hand to the poor and to the needy neighbor in your land. Will we heed this command or will we find reasons to justify why we will not? Do you remember how Jesus answers the question, who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to be loving like I love myself in Luke chapter 10. Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan who goes to his enemy and doesn't ask him how he wound up in that ditch, doesn't ask him the bad decisions that he's made along the way. He just takes him out of the ditch, puts him on his horse, and takes him with great, at great expense, pours out the things with which God had blessed him lavishly for a man who was his enemy. He did that because he saw a fellow human in need, and he loved him like he would have loved himself. If we are going to proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations, then we are called to proclaim the whole of the gospel and recognize that it will always call us to deeper and more holy living as the family of God. We want to be people of radical holiness in the world. But we are also called to be people of radical generosity, even to those who are different than us. But let me move on to my second point. There is great hope in what happened in Jerusalem this past week. The Gafcon movement, if you will, reminds us that at the core of the church, there is the beating heart of faithful orthodoxy. There is at the heart of the church a desire to be changed by the Word of God every time we read it, to be willing to let it convict us and shape us and change us year by year, season by season, more and more into the beautiful people of God. It's a call back to radical, spiritually sound gospel living, and it's an invitation to do that with believers all over the globe. Like we are a family as Anglicans. We number almost 90 million. And to be in that room, and Mimi and I kind of tucked our way up at this, on this balcony, we could look down on about 1,800 of the people gathered there. And gathered there were indeed every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. It was a foretaste of that great crowd in Revelation 7 that will gather at the throne of God to worship him forever. Most of you know that the Gafcon movement is led by the church in Africa, 
but it consists of churches from every corner of the world. We worshiped being led by a Nigerian choir, and yet there were voices of faithful pastors from Rwanda and Canada and Chile and Brazil and Canada and England and America, all of them is with one accord calling us all back to faithful gospel living. And it was a reminder to me and a great hope to me that in the kingdom of God there is neither Jew nor Greek, black nor white, American nor non-American, colonizer nor colonized. In Christ we are a family. And that family transcends all of our tribalisms. That family transcends all of our other identities. You know, at one point, we all gathered on the southern steps of the temple, which is that place where the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, and that 3,000-person baptism took place. So all 2,000 of us gathered on those southern steps, and um, it took us about three hours to take one photograph. My patience was tested deeply on that day. In fact, they even had to build a special platform on the eastern edge of the southern wall to accommodate our crowd, which makes me believe that it was the single largest group ever photographed on the southern steps. Now, my wife will tell you that her husband wept through most of that experience, and not because I was impatient because it took three hours, but rather because I sat there in the middle of that Nigerian choir who was singing all around us. But I was sitting next to my wife and to Bishop Paul and to Mama Agnes, and I realized in that moment that I was sitting in a place that looked and sounded much like heaven is going to look and sound. Some of you may not know this, but the money that you raised at the bazaar, Marilee, um, by trading all of your furniture every year, um, the vestry voted to use a portion of those funds to bring um, Paul and Agnes to GAFCON. So thank you for your generosity. That moment of sitting with them was made possible by the good people of Christ Church. But I just sat there thinking that while the secular world around us ties itself up in knots over anger and race and borders and parties, we get to be the church. We get to be different than the rancor of the world around us. We get to proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations as a people made up of every race, every nationality, every sense of tribal identity. We get to be pure and holy together. We get to love one another with other-preferring, self-sacrificing love. And as a family, we get to live differently than the world around us. We get to stand up for the poor and the broken and the outsider because that's what God did for us. When we take that seriously... It will change the way we live as the church. And I believe that that is the hope of every nation in the world, is the church there would be faithful to their call. We keep our eyes focused on the upward call of the gospel. We will not allow ourselves to be stuck in the bitterness and the racism and the prejudice of a broken, fallen, divided world, something that is true not just in America but across the globe. The church is everywhere, and where we are, we will live differently than the world around us. We will proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations, first by asking God to change our own hearts and then living as those changed people in such a way that the world around us sees Christ in all of his glory. So let me close with this. Gafcon is a reminder that God has called a people out of the world, and he has called them to be his disciples. He's made us one family in him. And our readings, both from the Gospel of Mark and from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, remind us that God is who knits us together. We don't do this of our own accord. He takes Jews and Gentiles and he puts them together. He takes outsiders and insiders and he puts them together. It's a revolutionary way of thinking about human life. We get to be that body 
that repents of the ways that we remain divided so that we might come together and the world might see something different about us. In Mark, we see Jesus showing the love of God, not just to his friends, but to his enemies. I mean, think about who Jairus was. He was one of the leaders of the synagogue, the ones who were throwing him out and opposed to his teaching. And yet he goes to Jairus' house and he takes his daughter by the hand, even though touching her would have made him ritually unclean. He brings her back to life. You may recall in last week's lesson from Mark that we found Jesus across the lake among the Gentiles. This week, we find him back in town among the Jews, reminding us that God's kingdom is, one of its purposes is to draw us together across every border that divides us so that we might together do the work he has given us to do. Now, likewise, that's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians today. Paul is celebrating and trying to guilt the Second Corinthian church into getting on with the program the fact that the Macedonian church had given lavishly to the church in Jerusalem. These are Gentiles blessing the Jews. It would have been so easy for the church in Macedonia to say, this is ours, this is our property. I am not sharing this. The Jews in Jerusalem are going to have to figure it out for themselves. You know, get a job. But instead, the, that church recognized the character of the God who became poor for their sake, so they, they might become heirs of God Most High. That's the generous spirit that we are to reflect in all that we do. I want to make sure that we hear what God's word is saying today. Jesus makes us one family and he calls us to live holy lives, disciplined and obedient to his commandments. But then as that holy family, we are called to show the world what God's radical generosity looks like. And we show the world that we have been changed We are not satisfied with the divisions of this world. but Rather, we are going to proclaim Christ faithfully to the nations by loving others the way that we have first been loved. The GAFCON movement is a reminder that God's word calls us to do just that. By his spirit, may we do so to the praise of his glory. Amen? Amen.